Hi, Kristen Snowden. Great Hello. to see you. Yes, happy to be here. Hello, yeah. everyone. Um, thank you for joining. I am doing the same webinar that I do every second Wednesday of the month at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, which is having an open lecture, education, and then discussion Q&A on all things relationships. So if you ever want to join us live, we're available and the links are always down in the um, description. But today we are going to round up the final section of Life Anonymous's um, theme, which is exploring how the 12 steps, um, something that has helped millions and millions of people get clean from addictions and other kind of um, mental health, personal, emotional struggles, how these themes and concepts can be applied generally to everyone. Um, we are on step 10. And that is, that is continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Like most of the 12 steps, the sentences sound so simple, but really the concepts and the applications of how people do daily inventories is, is the most power, powerful part. So I'd encourage you to just hang in there with me because I always wonder when I'm reading through the 12 steps, I'm meeting people who got true recovery through this 12 step fellowship and community and really live the 12 step concepts. Um, they're so inspiring that I just always wonder to myself, what if this world adopted these 12 step concepts? What if your workplace adopted these 12 step concepts? What if your relationship took daily inventories and adopted these concepts. So hang in there because I really think this is applicable to everybody, whether you're a betrayed partner, an addict in recovery, or just someone trying to look to get out of unhealthy patterns or learn to just do a better way of life. Um, the first nine steps, just a really quick summary, is the first three steps is owning that you have a problem, you need help, you kind of wave your white flag, get you around your community, start accepting influence to figure out how to get out of this. Um, steps four through seven are that personal inventory, exploring mainly the past, some of the present of kind of how it all went wrong, what's your good, bad, light, dark, what are the common themes, the character defects, so to speak, but that's just a lot of personality flaws or trauma or shame, all that stuff, our family history that kind of serves up in the platter every time we show up as a human being every day. It's becoming really aware of everything, all the parts of ourself that show up when we try to do relationships, when we try to be vulnerable, when we try out to go out and do new things, old things, all things. Um, and then eight and nine is we take our focus out of our internal growth process and try to repair um, interpersonal relationships, the so relationships with other people, making amends where we need to, really exploring, okay, what's my part in this? This person might have harmed me here or there, but maybe I can make amends for this part that I want to own and I want to take accountability for. Um, that can sound tricky and sticky, but I'd encourage you, I have two separate videos on steps eight, nine, and we really, really talk about that um, in detail. So now we're at step 10. And the idea is that now that you've done all this life dissection, self-examination, personality dialysis, it's time to kind of go out into the world and start engaging in an everyday present daily practice. And that's what steps 10, 11, and 12 are about. Um, you know, Scott, who co-wrote this with me, says that steps one through nine are what get someone sober, but steps 10 through 12 are what keep people sober. Um, because it's, uh, so let's say it's their smaller daily versions of steps four through nine, which is, like I said, it's that taking that inventory, going out to the relationship, seeing what your part is in it, what this, what's the story you're telling yourself, where to make amends, how to engage with these people, what you need to let go of. Um, and instead of dealing with the past, which is what steps four through nine are focused on, you're dealing with everyday present day issues. Um, because so much of this is about just learning how to navigate the messiness of human relationships, how to deal with the shame that we walk around with, 
the guilt that's giving us messages about what we need to change, what we need to re do differently in the future, et cetera. So what do we do when we're taking an inventory? What's step 10? Um, as far as from Scott's version of a recovering addict, when they are coaching them on how to take daily inventories, they say sometimes it's a hourly practice. Sometimes it's something that you're done, you do throughout the day. Sometimes it's just something you do at the end of the day as you're kind of saying your prayers or doing your meditation or gathering yourself about what happened at the end of the day. You kind of do this internal check-in and say, all right, what happened today? Um, did I make choices and behave in ways that are aligned with my values and goals? Did I keep my promises? Did I act within who I want to be? Um, if you remember from steps like five, six, and seven, you become intimately aware of what your character flaws are, what the not so great parts of yourself are, who comes out when I'm tired or I'm struggling or I feel unappreciated um, or I feel like I'm in shame. And did that did those parts of myself come out anywhere? And then if the answer is yes, and you need to own parts where you fell short in any of these ways, how do I want to make amends? Um, sometimes it's a matter of picking up um, your cell phone and texting, you know, I want to go back to that conversation. I didn't respond the way I wanted to. Sometimes it's turning to your partner when you calmed down and said, wow, that got out of hand, out of hand really fast. That's not really what I was trying to say let me try this again, or I was not able to hear you, tell me again, or go back to your kids and repair after you just blew up at them for something that had nothing to do with them, but you were just overwhelmed. Or maybe it did have to do with them, but you just didn't say it in a kind, respectful way that was very productive. So step 10 is an invitation to take an inventory and assess, self-examine and self-correct on a daily, even hourly basis. Now, let me just remind you that um, for addicts in recovery, the reason why they added step 10 into the 12 steps is, as you can imagine, addicts in their state of addiction the last thing they want to do is self-examination. The last thing they want to do is explore opportunities for growth. They're stuck on like, I have my favorite coping skill, which is my substance of choice or my addiction behavior of choice over shopping, overeating, having sex, you know, casual encounters, raging, et cetera. Um, I don't want to think about why I do it. I don't want to think about who I might be harming by these behaviors. I just do. And yeah, I feel shame somewhere, but I don't want to deal with that. But the more shame I feel, the more I want to go out and act out. And that's kind of the cycle of addiction. Um, so step 10 is so important because it's inviting something that addicts at one point never wanted to bring into their life. Self, self-examination, self-correction, and assessing how they show up in this world might impact other people. And now step 10 is saying, you need to start doing this every day. This is an everyday thing. And, and hopefully by step nine, after completing step nine, there used to be this fear, this resistance, this deep shame, this, ugh, I don't want to look in the mirror and realize everything I've done, all the lies I've said, all the horrible things I've done, all the bad, all the people who've harmed me and the deep abandonment and hurt that I feel when I realize how painful that all is. Um, but once you've kind of done those really scary steps, um, one through nine, and hopefully felt the relief that came from it, that will um, encourage you to want to bring it into your life daily. You know, it'll almost be like your tolerance for discomfort of a, a bad exchange with someone, an uh, uncomfortable conversation with someone at work, or you yelling at your kids in a way or speaking to them in a way you didn't mean to, that will come that will be so noticeable to you that you will want to talk about it, um, own your part in it, work it out, fix it, change it. Um, so that's, that's definitely one of the greatest gifts of, that 12 steps brings is um, A, you get rid of the numbing um, and distraction of your addiction, but you also start learning that, yeah, for a minute it feels uncomfortable, 
but then you can actually make these choices, engage in these behaviors, do these things to try to get out of the chaos, the hurt, the pain, and transcend to a better place with your loved ones, with your coworkers, with people around you. It definitely is meant to empower you. Um, and all of this concept is, you know, this daily inventory, um, making amends when necessary and promptly, admitting when you've done something wrong, engaging, having those uncomfortable conversations. Um, you'll hear in the addiction world, it's keeping your side of the street clean. That's what it's about. It's always about keeping your side of the street clean. So um, when you're taking the inventory, um, let's talk about this. I think I have, it's all about hitting the pause button. When you learn about addiction recovery, um, there's a lot of impulse control. Uh, Kevin McCauley from the Meadows calls it like, um, we have a hedonic filter problem. We over, like it, addicts will over accentuate the reward of engaging in the addictive behavior and under measure, mismeasure what the negative consequences will be. So the more they are encouraged to hit the pause button and really think out um, is this aligned with who I want to be? What will the consequences be of this behavior? The better the result will be. So let's talk about taking the inventory. It's the first and foremost is always getting in tuned with and reconnected with your physical and emotional state. I think I've told you a million times, addiction is done from a disconnected state. Trauma, it causes you to be disconnected. You're not paying attention to your physical state. You're not paying attention to the thoughts that are going on in your head, the story that you're telling yourself. What is this feeling? Is this stress? Is this hurt? Is it shame? Is it guilt? Um, what caused this? You know, she raised her eyebrow at me. That bad thing happened at work. I got that uncomfortable email. It's doing a full inventory of hitting the pause button and stretching out your awareness of what just happened. You know, and I always, feel like once you connect with the physical state, because that's kind of like the most tangible thing that that burning in your chest, the spinning thoughts where you can't collect anything, the feeling of nausea in your stomach, the tension, the heat, those are much more tangible cues that you can grab hold on and say, ooh, this is an uncomfortable feeling. What happened? I need to stop, look and listen. And then the other part, once you get past that, okay, what am I feeling? What is this? What caused this? is exploring what's the story that I'm telling myself about what happened. I, I love that. If you could adopt one thing, it would be that in relationships, everything. I am constantly asking myself, Kristen, what's the story you're telling yourself right now? This feels gross. What's happened that's made you feel gross? Um, and then the step beyond that is, okay, so what's my part in this? Do do I need to do something? What, what can I do about it? Is this something that's just it's completely disconnected from it. You know, it's God grant me the serenity to, to accept what I can accept, to change what I can change, the courage to know the difference. It's that, that moment where I examine, do I need to adjust how I showed up? Do I need to make repairs? Um, I was talking about how um, the two questions that I try to ask myself on a daily basis, well, besides what story I'm telling myself is, is this particular behavior, what I did or what happened or how I showed up or how I responded, is it congruent with my values and goals? Or in order to do this or when I did this or how I engaged after this or in response to it, did I lie or manipulate? Um, or did I just not show up authentically? You know, did I minimize that I was upset or lie and say that I wasn't, et cetera? Um, so let me just say a couple quotes from this book really fast. Um, Being human is a permanent condition. There's no cure for our imperfections, our struggles, at least maybe not while we're on this earth. The closest we can get to true recovery is an ongoing commitment to the, do the best that we can based on what we know at that time. To this end, we must be willing to continuously assess our behavior and choices to learn from them and to make amends when necessary. Once we know better, we do better. That's just the idea. As imperfect humans, we tend to make forward progress, then we'll fall back. The essential piece is that we must consciously, humbly, and without defensiveness, work toward forward progress 
as best as we can, as often as we can. Everyone screws up, ladies and gentlemen, to various degrees. But the real damage, the lasting damage, is typically done only when we refuse to acknowledge our mistakes and then make that next step to make amends. We do lots of things. I mean, in step nine, I talked about how and why hurt people hurt people um, and the importance of kind of always remembering that. Um, it's not a blaming and shaming thing. It's just a framework that helps you maybe show empathy or compassion towards yourself, towards other people. This complements that process when you're um, in that daily inventory. Um, so the last thing I'm going to do is just a couple exercises to help you. How do I show up every day? This is this is a kind of a guide to how do I show up in at my workplace as a human being in this world, as a citizen of this world, in my relationship how, with my children, friends, family. What's the inventory that I can use? Kind of a tangible question and answer guideline of how do I show up? Um, and this is based on Brene Brown's um, BRAVING acronym. She uses this B-R-A-V-I-N-G acronym, but I kind of adjusted it because some of the word choices were interesting just based on trying to make the BRAVING thing spell out correctly. But the first question is, is well, the five or the guideposts are, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guideposts. Authenticity, boundaries, accountability, integrity, non-judgment, giving other people the benefit of the doubt, self-care and gratitude. So in addition to asking myself, um, did I show up authentically? Okay. In addition to asking myself, am I living congruently to my values and goals? Um, and do I, did I, or do I have to lie and cheat or manipulate in order to make this happen? Um, I explored, did I show up? Was I authentic to myself? Um, was I consistent? Did I manipulate? Was I defensive? Was I fake in any way? Did I do the people pleasing or the chameleonizing just to like get someone to like me? Boundaries. Was I clear with others about what was okay and what's not okay? Am I aware of what I need and what I experienced? And did I communicate both of those things clearly? At the same time, was I able to hear and respect other people's boundaries? Accountability. Did I explore where I may have fallen short? Did I respond to others appropriately or from a reactive place? Um, what do I need to do to clean up my side of the street? Integrity. Did I practice my values rather than profess them? That is one of my favorite sayings that she says. Do you practice your values? Do people know what you stand for because they watch you do it? Because you do it in everything that you do on a daily basis versus profess them. You know, this is what I believe in. And did I behave in a way that fully honors and is integrated with my values, goals, and priorities? The word integrity, right? We all say we want to live with integrity, the great name of your treatment center, seeking integrity, which I love that name because it's all about being integrated. That is the root that the same, I put out the same Kristen that everyone gets to see, that my children see the same Kristen that my husband sees, that my coworkers see, that um, my clients see and friends see. There's not this chameleonizing and putting on different facades to get different needs met. Um, that's absolutely one of my character flaws. And I slip into that sometimes. And I constantly need to have a checks and balances system to go back and, and check that, explore why I'm doing it and change that behavior. Um, Non-judgment. Did I create an environment where I can be present for others' experiences and stories without judging them? I find as we're living this year and a half in COVID, this is my confessional, as I feel more unsafe, as this world gets more uncertain, I cling on to judgments. I cling on tighter to stereotypes. I don't know if it's my, um, like the human brain in me, just trying to make something uncertain, certain, right? Grabbing hold of it. But non-judgment is something I have to regularly, so often check myself on. 
Um, do I have people around me where I can share my story openly and freely without feeling shamed and judged? And by golly, do I provide that same safe environment for other people to have a safe space to share their thoughts and feelings. And I can listen, I can agree to disagree. I can say, I'm not hearing that now, but I appreciate you sharing the story. I'll think about it. But do I provide a safe open space for that? I'm trying. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt. Do I try my best to maintain the idea that most people are doing the best they can with what they've been given? Brene Brown calls this generosity. Do I give a generous assumption to people? She, she has a whole section on this. So I'd encourage you to look this up because it was challenging for me, speaking of someone being judgmental, to give generous assumptions to people. What if, how would you operate in this world? How would you move about your day if you adopted the belief system that everyone's just trying to do the best they can? Yes, hurt people, hurt people. Yes, people struggle. Yes, people fall short. Yes, people are imperfect. But what if you kind of had that foundational understanding that they were doing the best they can? It's an interesting, it's challenging. It's challenging. And then self-care and gratitude. Um, am I taking steps to maintain my mental health and well-being by practicing gratitude, thankfulness, appreciation as often as possible and with all things? So those are the inventory that you can take while you're driving, while you're taking a break, while you're breathing, while you're scanning on your phone, while you're, you know, it's just, these are things that you can explore as, as you are recounting conversations or arguments or upsetting things that you saw on social media, whatever. It's just it, constantly taking that inventory, you know, and Scott emphasizes, and this is important that you know, you might need to be doing these hourly by the minute, but then they start becoming more natural. They start becoming more integrated into your daily life. So it starts just kind of becoming the framework that your brain works in. Um, and, and it's, I think it's a really great system to show up authentically, but with boundaries and vulnerably, but in as healthy way as possible. Um, and that is it on daily inventories. So um, I, I think what you're just sharing too is so important because it does get easier and um, it becomes part of who, who you are if you, you know, if you're faithful about doing this, but you know, I don't have, you, you mentioned tolerance. I don't have tolerance. Like I know, like now I know, you know, and I had a colleague, um, this was a, a while back, but you know, like I, I, I think I was a little snarky on the phone. I don't even remember the whole incident, but I just was like, that was so not okay. And so I immediately picked up the phone and called this person back and said, I just, you know, I, you didn't need that. That was, that was all me. You didn't need that. And the freeing thing about that is regardless of the person's actions or reactions to that, I, you know, like you said, I've cleaned up my side of the street. Now that person was stunned you know, um, uh, that I was like calling him and because he was like, well, it's all okay. I said, no, it, wa it wasn't okay. I'm, you know, I need to do this for me, you know? And so I'm doing it for me. Does it help? You know, I've had people and, and it's meaningful. I mean, like from two decades ago, I remember, you know, somebody else I worked with, apparently I have issues sometimes. Um, <laughs> but you know, like I, I probably mm -hmm. some snarky comment. I, again, I don't remember the incident, but you know, I, you know, I, I apologize. And I remember she said, I forgive you. And she used those words. I still remember, I remember the exact setting. So I don't remember what I did, but, but her using that, I forgive you was so powerful to me and I, and motivating. Cause I was like, you know, I want to feel that again, I'm willing mm -hmm. to do the cleanup. One of the things that I learned um, in recovery was while you're doing the first nine, you can start on 10. So, you, so you're going to clean up the past, but you can start cleaning up right now, right now, like I didn't have to like add it to the list for steps, you know, four and five, you know, I could take care of this, the because I was clearly creating havoc, you know, even, you know, when I got into recovery. So, um, so that was really helpful for me that I didn't have to keep adding to the pile, I could start taking care of that right away. Um, and um, regardless of what the other person does, I think that that's a really key thing is, you know, I have to have no expectation and it's like eight, and nine, I have to have no expectation on what the other person's going to do. I really have to do it just for myself. You know, I, I, 
like literally right before this webinar, I had a story that I was telling myself and it was, you know, and I went and told my husband, I said, you just have to listen because I need to vent, you know, and, you know, but it was, and it, and what it came down to was mom guilt, you know, like I'm, I'm going to be this failure because I'm not going to show up, you know, you know, and I was just like, I have to let it go. And you were talking about um, being judgmental. Mine is control. I have found that I've had, Mm. had more of a struggle during COVID with the control, you know, because everything has felt out of control. And so I, I have realized that I am, you know, trying to glom onto anything that I perceive I have control of, which is mm, my actions and reactions, and that's it, you know. And so if I don't want to have to, you know, continue to make more amends, you know, the best way for me to uh, address this is to understand, you know, that I have a choice in how I act and react. Um, sometimes, you know, per- perfectly human. And so, yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, something happens, but, but I don't want, you know, like you're talking about the integrity and the congruence, you know, like I know, like I, I have very little tolerance for that um, lack of serenity. My gut starts, ch- I feel it. I feel it in my body. I, my gut starts churning. I know something is wrong and I don't want to feel that way. I lived in that chaos. And I don't want to feel that way anymore. So, so the, fastest way for me to align is to to do the maintenance steps to take my inventory go yep regardless of what somebody else did to me the story I tell myself it really is what is my part in it and how can I um how can I fix my part and get my guts to be calm again and that is you know that is so worth you know the having to take the inventory and not blame somebody else it's you know it's living a different way so so i love these maintenance steps cuz you know those those are the things that like you said you know the, it gets us sober but it also this is the and it's sober or calm or serene or whatever congruent you know like i can live in the real world because i have these tools to be able to do that and i didn't have them until i was taught so i love that you wrote life anonymous for everyone because these are just good life skills to have and um you know i don't think all of us you know it isn't like just addicts that you know struggle with stuff and life and everything so to have practical tools where if i do this you know i can change things you know is really meaningful so We have a question. Um, I've come to believe that in order to cast off harmful coping mechanisms for good, addicts ought to challenge their core beliefs, the story we tell ourselves, and then embrace new core truths. Is that what you see as the role and the result of step 10? I think it's the entire process that gets you there. Um, I think we start exploring our, our previous core beliefs in steps four, Um, and then start realizing how they're just not serving us by exploring our character defects and how we show up in relationships. Um, That step 10 allows us to kind of stand and practice the new core beliefs that, you know, I, you, I was someone who showed up really angry, or I was someone who believed in white lies, or I was someone who would behave sarcastically or passive aggressively and still am capable of that. But I'm choosing to repair or try to be better once I realize that that happens and also take responsibility for, well, then maybe you shouldn't exhaust yourself so much. Maybe you need to work on your time management because, you know, this is what leads to you being passive aggressive or sarcastic or whatever. You know, it's not just like the mistakes you keep making. You need to change your life so you can feel safer, calmer, or more serene. So it's stepping into, um, step 10, yeah, might be the act of you living these new core beliefs, practicing them, so to speak. But practicing them is correct, because, you know, like, yes, it would be lovely to say, I've cast off all of those, and now I'm, you know, like, I just, I mean, like, still today, you know, things ping against stuff, you know, and those old, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, the mom I should be, I'm failing as this or whatever, you know, I, I have to confront that because Mm -hmm. those will still pop up. And the more, you know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, stressed, the more, the more vulnerable I am to those old messages, you know, so, so making sure I'm doing the things I do need to do the maintenance steps helps me 
you know, be in a better position to keep those new core beliefs, you know, for in the forefront um, and be able to, to challenge, you know, the, you know, the story I'm telling my, I'm telling myself a silly story right now. That's not so helpful. What do I need to do to shift it? So, but we never, you know, this is a journey, but it's life anonymous. It's, it's not like, oh, you did this and now you're done. And now you're going to be, you know, you know, you're perfectly, you know, in your integrity, you're living, you know, the very Zen life, you're doing everything right. It's messy. Okay, next question. I am suffering from betrayal trauma. And even though I have not seen or spoken this man for one year now, 15 years in a relationship, since two days, I have a huge shame attack feeling I'm not worthy. And I'm just deeply in pain, sad, anger, angry, while I know I was a good partner. Can you please talk about this? Also, I want him to suffer. I never had that. So the feeling of the uh, revenge is coming up. Right. So I, I'm um, so glad you're here. I'm so sorry, but yeah. Um, yes. And I believe a lot of other betrayed partners can completely relate to those statements, those feelings of deep shame, sadness, they'll, they'll wash over you. Um, sometimes you find betrayal trauma can almost act like that, that grief list. If anyone of, you know, I have a, um, podcast or I, I have a webinar on grief and how we kind of societally really screw it up, but betrayal trauma, Betrayal trauma's journey is a journey through some grief and sadness. And so we go through those dabda stages, the five stages of grief, the um, depression, anger, bargaining, um, denial, and then acceptance. And remember, they don't happen linearly. They don't happen chronologically. So one minute we might feel like we're in this acceptance stage and we feel like we're standing in our power. And then a song comes on or a memory passes through us or anniversary comes by, or we don't even freaking know, but suddenly we're questioning why we're so valueless, how this person could do this to us. Um, you know, and then, and then our brain, don't forget shame is that useless mechanism we have in our brain that wants us to write us write a story in our head that makes us feel like we have some control over someone else's messed up behaviors and choices. So if I want to desperately be loved, that's just a part of who I am, a social creature who wants to love and be loved. I'm going to have this deep opposing force inside me called shame, which is always kind of pushing back going, uh, what if you're not enough for that? Like, what if this is too gross or messed up or not sexy enough or too dumb or they get angry, this gets angry too much or too judgmental. Um, that is always creeping inside you. And so that might be contributing to why you feel this shame attack is there's these moments where you're like, no, he did this. I couldn't have changed it. It had nothing to do with me. You know, he was um, sick with an addiction and he never wanted to get help. Whatever the story is, I'm making that up. And then there's a moment where that shame comes in and goes, oh God, no, that feels so unsafe that an intimate, close, vulnerable partner could do that to you, um, that you, something you have no control of, you can't prevent it. That's too frightening. And then your brain goes, okay, well then let me write a story. Well, maybe if you'd had sex with him more then this wouldn't have happened. Or maybe if you were prettier or smarter, or you did this different thing, or you made this different choice, it's that shaming, disgusting, it's the lies that come at you, making you feel like you would have had control of this, like you could have changed it, prevented it, stopped it, but it's not. You have to realize that it is just that all lies. Um, and the last comment that you said about, I want him to suffer, um, that's another part that kind of rushes over you that can feel very shaming and blaming as well, that you have these kind of poisonous thoughts in your head that you wish harm on them and you wish death on them, you wish torture on them. And you consider yourself this, you know, stable-minded, kind, human-loving person, compassionate. Um, you have to just understand that, that your brain, there's a whole other part of your brain that's not the like intelligent, conscious, like what are my values and who am I as Kristen and, and who are you? there's this part that like just focuses in on survival, like what is dangerous and what isn't. And this man who betrayed you is very dangerous to that brain, very dangerous. 
So like all other threats in your life, you you wish them to be non-existent. You wish them to be gone and, and not around, not threatening. So sometimes the wishing of like suffering, I want him to suffer, I want him to be tortured or in deep pain is that like, you're dangerous, you're scary. I wish bad things on you, go away. It's that kind of reactive survival brain response in you. You wanna add anything else, Tammy? Well, yeah, it, so, um, and I don't know if anything was triggering in the last two days. Like sometimes, like Kristen said, it isn't, you know, there isn't really any one thing, but sometimes it was the anniversary of something or what, whatever, you know, the song came on the, the radio or whatever, but, um, I, you know, I had to, this is the thing I really hated is um, people uh, told me that I was allowing, you know, people that betrayed me and hurt me to live rent free in my brain. And I hated that because that was like, wait, me? No, it's them. And, but, but at some point I had to choose for my own sanity. Um, this is just me. So take what you need and leave the rest. But, um, but I had to do some practical tools in order to, um, to let that go. And it, and it was, you know, it wasn't fun. Um, but the freedom I got from that, you know, like, like as soon as I see this stuff, I go, oh yeah, I remember those revenge, you know, um, uh, I had two people that I wanted to have a head on collision. This is, I mean, I can be really, really horribly mean and horrible. This is decades ago, but I could, you, you know, I immediately both. thought of it. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> if they had a head on collision, then all my problems would be, you know, they'd be fine, you know, cause they'd be gone. And, you know, so, I, but I was like, that is not who I am. They're both still alive. And, um, you know, like now I don't wish them any ill. I just don't have to, they, they have no, they don't have power over me. I think that's what it was is, you know, I took, I didn't let them rent in my head anymore. And so, so there are tools and techniques to use that, you know, that you can um, move beyond that. But um, one of the things that I thought of too, and I've shared this, you know, Harriet Hunter did a journaling, there is research about journaling. And I would invite you to journal that deep pain, that sadness, that anger, uh, you put it down on paper, and then possibly also, you know, journal about, you know, how he betrayed you, um, and, and journal maybe about how worthy you are of having somebody who is a real partner for you that will be there for you and not hurt you. Um, uh, there's science to the journaling. So, so there, there's a lot of things that can help you. I'm glad you're here. Grounding exercises, mindfulness for me, getting outside, you know, these pictures that I take, you know, that are my background are me when I'm out running, I'm intentional about seeing things that are out there. That's really helpful and healing for me um, and reminding myself that the world is way bigger than me and my control. So um, um, the, the pain is real, but there's also a path through it, not, not completely out of it, but, but through it. So, um, so there's a betrayed partner group today at uh, 1230 Pacific time. I'd invite you to join that too. So, so if you're using Life Anonymous to work the 12 steps as a non-addict or partner, are there meetings or sponsors available? That's a great question. And I wish, you, but what are your thoughts? Well, the Life Anonymous book is um, kind of, it's written by a therapist, me and a recovering addict who's been writing curriculum for decades for recovery. So it, while we have the name Life Anonymous, which can sound like um, Codependence Anonymous or, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, it, it's meant more, it's storytelling, it's it's got exercises and kind of fill-ins and educational um, things in it. So as of right now, there's not like a Life Anonymous 12-step meeting, um, that because that would obviously, that all 12 steps should be accessible to everybody, they should be free, they should be, um, there should be like a safe and healthy structure and process to be acknowledged through the 12-step fellowship or community that they're like a um, real program, but I, I know that they send a lot of people who don't identify as an addict, for instance, but maybe your betrayed partner, or you're struggling to things like Al-Anon, S-Anon, um, Prodependence Anonymous, which is a real 12-step community, has real 12-step programs, um, and it's really helping people move beyond that codependent model where they can sometimes be blaming and shaming. 
Yeah. And I think it would be great to just go, Hey, you know, I mean, people do book studies all the time. You know, you could do something like a book yeah. study and be peer support and, you know, and working through, as Kristen said, working through the, you know, exercises in it as well. Um, you, you know, if you're not an addict, but you're showing up here, um, you know, you, you may want to talk to addict. I mean, Kristen did this book, like she said, with, you know, with Scott Brassard, who is in recovery and, to, you know, talking to, to an addict about their experience with it, how you can look at it differently, how they you know, could be helpful. Step, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And we, we have the um, exercises in here. So if you have a, a community, like a support community, you guys can work the steps together, so to speak. Um, go to a therapist and, and go through some of this stuff. Right. So um, I think the ideal thing is to, to work it in, in unison in a group where people can call each other out, challenge each other, accept and love each other, that kind of environment. But yeah. And I agree. Cause you know, part of, so, well, I'm, I'm an addict. So, so I have to look at it from that lens, but you know, we, I needed the community to sh- to help me, to guide me, to point out things, you know, that, that, you know, that when I was doing things well, that they could help me go, look, you know, this is good. And, you know, this isn't working so well for you and, you know, helping with the accountability and seeing things, you know, uh, you know, I, I think as humans, we all have blind spots. So it's easy to, to not see things that, could be useful for us on the journey. So having, you know, peers that can be supportive, you know, is, is a good thing, but creating your own, you know, peer group, you know, like I said, I, I, I would encourage that, whatever that looks like for you, but safe people that, you know, that are in it as you are you yeah. know, to learn and grow. So um, I will add, I forgot. I did just post new live workshops that are available via mm-hmm. zoom on my website. Um, there's betrayed partner support groups where there's a lot of concepts and material from here. And then there's a, what I call courageous connection where we kind of deal with the fears and the obstacles of showing up authentically, vulnerably, all that shame stuff that I talk about so often that really learning about that and practicing that can be life-changing. And so on kristensnowden.com, I have a few workshops um, where you can, they're very small. We work on material similar to this or exactly like this. Um, in a very small group, eight people or less, um, and, and really kind of sort through this in a safe, non-judgmental way. And I do, uh, many partners who are reaching out for support beyond the free stuff that we have on sex and relationship healing.com. I do point many of them towards your workshops because I do think having support as partners, you know, in those environments and is a really good thing. And, and quite frankly, I've heard from some partners who have gone through the program and they have been complimentary. So I do think that is a resource to consider as well. Um, and we do have workshops for work groups for both porn addiction starting October 14th and then the sex addiction 101 starting November 3rd. Those are on the seeking integrity site. So those are a six week course live facilitated for practical tools, again, in a, in a peer group, but with, you know, with a leader um, to go through and get, gain some of these skills. And um, again, look at the blind spots that, you know, are easy to miss when you're just beginning this journey. So other questions, we've, we, we've taken care of the questions. We would welcome them, so. Yeah, we've got a big group, so. Yeah, no questions. Yeah, yeah. so. It doesn't Kristen, have to be about step 10's inventory, correct. it can be anything. Kristen mentioned her uh, videos on YouTube, you can find them. Um, and we have previously recorded on sexandrelationshiphealing.com too. Under the resource tab, you'll see previously recorded, including that one for Harriet Hunter that I mentioned as well. So um, we've got some new offerings, um, both for partners and for male addicts. We've got the internal family systems groups. We started a um, Tuesday morning, one for male addicts and a Wednesday morning for betrayed partners. I've uh, They just started last week and um, the betrayed partner group uh, was large already and then yesterday I heard that the male group um, had grown too. So, so I think that those will be helpful new additions, but we will continue to add those support resources for you as well. So that's great. Who runs the IFS group? 
So uh, Heather Putney has the Wednesday morning for partners and Joe Savidra, who had done um, of the had been one of the facilitator moderators for the uh, Monday morning group, but now he's doing the IFS on Tuesday mornings for for men. So, so our little schedule is you know is you know continues to fill in with awesome. with options and support. So, and Dr. Rob is um, recording. He was very busy, but now he's going to be recording some podcasts again. So the podcast on sex, love, and addiction will be um, will be growing again as well. So, but. And well, I'm always available to all of you who are attending. You can always email me. Um, again, go to my website. It's Kristen Snowden, MFT at gmail.com. Or my website is Kristen Snowden.com for to get on my mailing list. There's blogs, articles, videos, um, live workshops, et cetera, available. And she is Kristen K R I S T I N. So um, you have to spell it right. So how do I do move I... from doing nothing, <laughs> doing nothing for myself to practicing self-care? That's a great question. My self-esteem and uh, men mentality is shot after recent discovery. That, that is so common. Yeah, so you, you, you know, I know, like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm I... honoring that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. So, yeah. Right. Right. And, and I think it's even great that you're acknowledging that, that, there's this time and space to kind of sit and do nothing because your brain has exploded, your life has exploded, and there's just got to be this like your brain's so overwhelmed and so overstimulated. There's got to be a break period. Um, but I, I would encourage you to just do baby steps. It, it, I don't know what the self esteem, uh, self care that might be where you can start what are things that provide a net gain to my soul versus a net negative? Um, so we just even identify that because right now talking to friends, for instance, it might feel like a net negative because you don't, you might feel like you have to hold back information. They wouldn't understand. You find them judging you. So that's not necessarily on a self-care list. If you find a net loss, from, from that, maybe going for a walk, um, listening to music, journaling, like, like Tammy just mentioned. Um, I don't know for the first step would be identifying what kind of things provide a net gain to you right now. And then maybe also own what, what feels like a net loss. Um, because there's things that I think you might not feel comfortable with saying, but Spending time with the kids might be something that's emotionally draining to you. And that's okay. You have to, you have to still show up if you have kids, I don't know. Um, but just always be mindful that, that that's something that's really challenging for you right now. Going out in any kind of public setting might be really challenging for you right now. So just, just start, start with what does or potentially could feel good and what do I want to start with and see if you can just incorporate one tiny thing um, per day. I have, um, I think the video, the YouTube video is called the neurobiology of betrayal trauma and, and how to heal, um, or even what our nervous, how our nervous system responds to, um, betrayal trauma. Those are some really more popular videos that I've done. And I think it's because I have lots of very specific tools that help you downregulate a very upregulated nervous system, very tired and overwhelmed brain and body and provides some really tangible tools in those videos that help downregulate just from the easy accessible things like deep breathing to more complicated punching a punching bag or you know talking to a therapist or doing EMDR or somatic experiencing kind of trauma treatments. So I do bake therapy. Like if I'm <laughs> highly stressed, I'm either cleaning or baking. So it's, okay. those are two things that you know, like, yeah. See, and those are net losses for me. I would never. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cooking would be a net loss. <laughs> baking is, yeah. So, so it's just, but I think it, it, my point is find what's meaningful to you. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, rocket science. I mean, baking is just you know, baking, you know, uh, but you know, cleaning a toilet. I feel good about the cleaning the toilet. My lungs. So. <laughs> like finding a good playlist and singing to every freaking song. Yeah. Like that's just, yep. that's cathartic yeah. to me. Yeah. I, and I do think it's, you know, find something, you know, I, th like there's apps for calm, you know, like calm and a whole bunch of others, but you know, there's mindfulness things that just, you know, sitting, 
and, you know, and being guided through, so it's not just your brain, but being guided through, you know, can be really helpful. So, um, but, but I do, I love what Chris was saying, find something that's a net positive for you, regardless of, you know, how it is for someone else. So, so uh, next question, do you have any advice for strengthening the new core belief system, especially for the addict? Do you find over time, old beliefs are less prominent and the new beliefs become more of the default? Yeah, yes. I do. In fact, science shows that our brain is plastic, which means it's flexible. Our, where our brains fire where they're wired. Um, and that's kind of, if you want to see so many webinars on, you know, from sexual relationship healing.com around our addiction and our trauma and our brain wires and has behaviors, you know, it's kind of that Pavlovian. If you ring the bell, the dog begins to salivate. Our brains are wired to do things without even thinking. It's just all in the effort of being the most efficient organ in our body because it's got a lot of stuff to do. Um, so the more it's the practice, it's the spending more time in that space, uh, ironically, not ironically, 11, um, step 11 is about kind of doing a, a prayer mindfulness practice. And I really think that's what it's about. It's, it's spending time with who am I, what are my core beliefs, what's the story go, I'm going on in my head, a more mindful person, a more conscious person is not going to go back to his or her addiction. Um, and so it sounds really hippie and dippy and the type A control freak of my yesteryears would never have believed this in a million years, but it is about sitting with something um, purposefully, but non-judgmentally thinking about it, what's going on in your head, journaling, you can understand why journaling works, talking about it works. The more you think it, the more you live it, the more you practice it, the more you process it in your long-term memory, the more it begins to rewire your brain. I mean, you'll see that in any kind of habit forming program, right? To change your eating, to change your working habits, to change your workout regimen. It's do it over, 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 over again, and your brain begins to wire around it. And I think, uh, you, yes, but I also think you, you stop having the tolerance to be able to tolerate those. Like, I don't like feeling, you know, going back to those old thought patterns. I, I don't like it. So I'm, I'm really quick to do something that's going to shift things for me. You know, like I said, I just, you know, told my husband, you have to listen to me for two minutes. Cause I gotta go do a webinar, you know, and, you know, and then I feel better, you know, and he's like, okay, whatever, you know? So, but I don't have the tolerance for that. And, and I was quickly able to go, oh yeah, that's false. You know, it's false mom guilt. I mean, the reality is, you know, that's not the case, but you know, so I'm able to process through it quicker, but I have less tolerance for it. So I want more of the, the new core beliefs um, you know, I don't want to go back. So, um, next question, can you please help me validate that it was not me that he chose the other woman above me? It would help me feel a little better. Thank you. So I want to validate that those are things that betray partners struggle with all the time. Um, I have, like I said, a couple very popular YouTube videos, um, from here that are again the neurobiology of betrayal trauma what is betrayal trauma and how to heal and then um your nervous system and stuff I, I have so many videos on on shame and empathy and self-compassion around people who are struggling with betrayal trauma so the more you can listen to my stuff i know i've heard michelle may's stuff she's great um i've heard some great podcast by Sandy Jacoy. These are people who know betrayal trauma so well. And when you're healing, that's speaking of adopting new core beliefs, if you keep getting that stuff in your ears and hearing it over and over again, you might not believe it, but then you start listening and hearing those people's voices mm -hmm. speak mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. His addiction had nothing to do with you. You didn't cause it. You can't cure it. You can't prevent it. Only he he chose to make those behaviors. Like, yes, we marital issues exist. Couples issues exist. Two people can have toxic interactions and healthy interactions. We always have choice in how we want to respond to conflict, to struggle, to feeling hurt, to, to doing the wrong thing, to feeling shame. He chose to act out. He chose to lean out of the relationship. 
he chose to seek out external sources instead of figuring out what was going on inside him and figuring out the healthiest, most congruent coping skills to manage life. So it's not you. Yeah. And I tell partners all the time, you know, nothing you could do or not do is going to change what he's doing and using heterosexual language, but because you know, he's choosing, he's not coming to you and going, oh, you know, I, I want to go see a marriage counselor because we're struggling with these things or whatever. You know, he sought someone else. So that's what he chose to do. That's an escape rather than, you know, sticking in the relationship. So, um, so um, uh, Dr. Stan Tatkin did a podcast with Dr. Rob. We do. And it talks about a healthy relationship. And it talks about the two of you working towards a partnership. He didn't, you know, somebody used an analogy and I wish I I could remember who it was, but, you know, like you doing couples work, you know, with one of you showing up, like you showing up and him not is like rowing a boat with one oar. you're just going to go around in a circle. So, so you can't fix it. It takes the two of you and he already left, you know, I mean, even before he left the relationship, he already left because he, you know, he stepped out of the relationship. So it isn't you. And speaking of the next comment that Tammy is going to read, him behaving the way he did outside your marriage is not an extension of your sickness or your problem. You're not a bad picker. You don't have problems or patterns with picking the wrong person. Um, There's many marriages that have these failures or flaws or defects in them show up like a partner has an addiction issue. And they choose to lean into recovery, engage in recovery, and and move to a healthier place despite what's happened. So, it's it's not your fault. You didn't cause it. So the next comment is I have I recognize that I have a long term reluctance to engage with twelve steps, even though I've gone to a twelve step group for betrayed partners for several years. So much of the readings and talking points were about were triggering for me. The women were a real gift, but the codependence model, again, we don't like that either. Not so much. Tips for getting past the baggage I have um, I have with 12 Step. So, um, so I hear you. You are not the only one that gets yeah. triggered by 12 Steps. And, and in fact, while I've been doing this 12 Step, um, this Life Anonymous stuff, I get a lot of pushback. You know, people struggle with language here or there. And they do the right thing, which is they raise their hand and say, I'm really struggling with the way you said this. I'm really, this is, this is what I'm hearing. Is this what you're saying? And the more you can engage with that, like the more, you know, I, I mean, I'm just gonna share a personal story that um, I had a period, especially after my mom died of struggling, reintegrating back into religious concepts. I was angry at God. Um, I hated all like religious constructs and everything, but I forced myself to go into them. And I, ask questions and I challenged and I got mad. I found the safe people who could have these difficult and comfortable conversations with me, you know, who I could say, this is what I hear and this is pissing me off. And if this is what it is, I don't want to be a part of this organization. And, and the right people could sit there with me and have respectful conversations about, I, I don't think that's what's going on. And, you know, and really help me work it out and figure out where my resistance was, where my pain was, um, where my trauma was, and really help kind of pull it up to the surface so I could work through it. So all the drop-in groups on our site use pro-dependence language. So do check them out. But, you know, I think, I mean, I hear stuff at 12-step meetings that I just go, take what you need and leave the rest, leave the personalities, whatever. But, you know, I do value the the community as well. So, um, and Jamie Marich did um, Trauma in the 12 Steps. She, I think she wrote a book called that too, but don't hold me to that. But email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com if you want that. It's also on the book uh, resource list on, on our site, but, um, but the, there is yeah. trauma in the 12 steps too. So, so check that oh, yeah. out. You may find some help too. Last question. We'll do this one. My husband is doing a bunch of hard work for recovery, but we are separated and he can't seem to say the one thing that I want to hear, which is I want our relationship to succeed. You and our son are so important to me. Is this a shame-based block that he can't want a better life? 
Well, I, I mean, I can't look into the mind of your husband, but I would encourage you to have a very direct conversation with him. You know, what's going on when I say that I need this, I, I need to hear that you're working towards this particular goal. I need to understand where I and our child stand in your priority list. You know, what's important to you, because obviously the betrayed partner, you feel like you made this addiction and this acting out behavior such a strong priority and you put so much time and energy into it. I want to know that your focus and your energy and, and your goals are about us, you know, you healing, healing this relationship, keeping this marriage intact or keeping this family safe. So um, maybe you can explore obviously with an appropriate therapist or professional about what those words mean to you, how they make you feel. And if there is resistance there, which I don't know, um, find out from him what's going on, where, where maybe he doesn't want to um, promise something that he's afraid he can't deliver on. Um, maybe he is so shame filled, he feels like he doesn't deserve it. So, I, you know, it's hard for me to express love to you. And I feel like I don't deserve it because I've done such schmucky things, things like that. Yeah, I think those are all valid. And I would, you know, he's doing the recovery work. So it sounds like his actions are, are showing you in some way. I, I know you want the words and I'm not diminishing that, but, but hopefully you're starting to see some, you know, some pieces of that, you know, that he, you know, that he's work, working on it, you know, and hopefully for, for all of you. So, but yeah, I think having the conversation with, with a professional would be great if you can, um, uh, you know, and just be, open to having, I mean, we've, on less of the other webinars, we've talked about having safe space to talk about, you know, certain things and it's within these guidelines and, you know, so that you've got the parameters set up so you can have the difficult conversations, but in a safe way for both of you. So, so thank you all for joining us and thank you, Kristen. I'll see you in November. So yes, you will. <laughs> Bye thank everyone. Everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining.